Mike, thanks a lot for uh, tuning in today. It's good to see you. My pleasure. Um, so again, I don't have an agenda or a list or anything. Good to see you too. <laughs> um, maybe, let's see. I don't know. Do you want to talk about what you're working on right now? Maybe that's, we can just start there. And, and just for folks who haven't done this before, feel free to put your questions in the chat box and then you can just unmute yourselves and you, I'll well, just build up a queue and you can chat with Mike yourself. Um, and we'll just, just take it like that. So I don't know, Mike, sure. if you want to start by just, you know, giving us a lay of land, what you're working on. Sure. Uh, well, for the last few years, uh, I've been working on the building this company, Observable. Um, and it really started out, um, you know, coming, coming out of the work that I was doing for D3. And, you know, one of the problems that keep uh, coming back to was essentially like how difficult it is to build interactive visualizations. Um, and you know, seeing a lot of the people learning D3 and struggling to figure out how to put the APIs together or to um, you know, really do creative stuff with all the examples that existed there. And uh, ultimately I kind of came to the conclusion that the biggest issue w wasn't uh, visualization per se, it was code. It was sort of the difficulty that people run into um, just writing interactive programs, building interfaces. Um, and I think part of that also comes to, you know, how much I enjoy writing code, or I guess like the, the joy that I get from code, um, mm -hmm. the flexibility, the power that it provides. It always felt like there was this compromise between, you know, tools that were based in code that could let you do whatever you want and tools that were sort of point and click and were easier to use, but were correspondingly, you know, much more limited in what you could create. And I always, uh, you know, I, I like the creative aspect of it. I don't want to build a, you know, kind of a patronizing tool uh, that um, makes all of the decisions for you. And mm -hmm. just, uh, I want things to be as easy to use as possible, but I don't want to take away people's creativity and freedom and whatever they create with it. And so that's, you know, that's the problem that I wanted to tackle is basically how do I let people have that expressiveness and that power um, that comes from code, but at the same time trying to make it more accessible and we did have a lot of, um, I think, success in the D3 community with the examples where people would sort of share those examples on blocks or elsewhere on the internet. Yeah. Um, and in a sense, like Observable was trying to kind of take that to the next level, right? Thinking about how can we sort of eliminate all of the technical obstacles to getting people to start tinkering with these examples so they don't have to, you know, get clone in the terminal and install a bunch of stuff and set up a local web server. Um, and have sort of a whole IDE set up locally. They can just get started in their browser. Um, but more than that, I think it's about thinking about, you know, the abstraction, the programming language. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, complexity, I think, in sort of traditional programming languages where you have mutable state and you have event listeners and you're sort of mutating things and remembering these side effects. And, you know, I've seen a lot of people struggle just getting that stuff working when they're trying to build uh, an interactive visualization. And, you know, I would prefer people spend time thinking about, you know, is the visualization communicating? Uh, you know, am I learning something interesting? Um, am I able to, you know, express or explain whatever it is that I'm trying to do? And hopefully spend less time with sort of the machinery, the, right. the technical aspects. And, and so that's, you know, essentially what we try to do with Observable is make reactivity sort of a language level feature rather than mm -hmm. just a, a library feature. And by doing that, it simplifies a lot of the code that you would need to write to make an interactive interface. Um, and I think the most exciting thing for me is it also has this kind of social effect where it becomes easier for you to import code that other people use and to compose it and to do interesting things. Uh, so, I mean, you can fork somebody's notebook, right. of course, but you can also import the cells directly into your notebook, and then you can even rewire them. So like a lot of the D3 examples, you know, you don't have to fork them in order to get your data into it. I mean, that's a, that's a valid strategy, but in addition to that, you can just import them and replace the data. And I think it's, it's really exciting to have kind of new ways of composing together code that's a bit more mm -hmm. flexible and repurposable. And 
you know, ultimately our goal is to try to help the community learn from each other and share their techniques um, and to bring more people in that are able to do, you know, visualization effectively. Right. What, um, and I'll just, I'll just, I'll just ask a couple of questions until people start asking you questions because I'm just the moderator. So I know Raul is out there, so I'm sure he's going to have questions, but, um, uh, what, what, in your view, what is the future of, of programming? I mean, so observable, you're trying to be at that, at that edge of how people are going to work together, but five years from now, do you have a vision of how people will work together on code? That'll be, will it be fundamentally different than how we're doing it now? Yeah, I don't think there's going to be sort of a grand unification. <laughs> I think that there's, or like one ring to rule them all or anything like that. I mean, right. I think there's, there's so many different um, applications and use cases and needs that there's always going to be sort of different languages, different ways of development, um, you know, different technologies, different styles, all that stuff. So I don't think we're trying to sort of uh, replace all of the different ways that people use programming right now. I think in a way how I view observable is more like uh, replacing Google Docs or replacing, you know, like Dropbox paper and stuff like that, mm -hmm. or Medium. Like basically like if code is this, is this language that enables us not just to do analysis, but also to communicate more effectively. Like we need that within our communication medium, right? Like we need that within our standard tools for working together with other people, for right. communicating, for presenting data, all that stuff. Um, and, you know, I certainly write a lot of uh, blog posts and articles that involve code <laughs> and having this like medium that lets me write prose and include visuals and make them interactive at the drop of a hat. I mean, that's, that's what I love about it. So I think of it more as focused around communication and collaboration rather than sort of general purpose programming. Um, although it certainly does have fuzzy lines and you can kind of extend it into a lot of different areas. Um, in fact, what I've been working on this week is, you know, learning serverless computing, like all the AWS stuff mm -hmm. and building more sort of stateful, uh, persistent, really like fully fledged web applications, essentially within an uh, observable notebook. Mm -hmm. um, and there was this great uh, interactive, um, Chris Zubekskis, I think is his name, uh, who made, uh, you know, can you identify Ukraine on a map? Like there was this... Um, uh, case where it was like uh, Mary Louise Kelly, the NPR reporter, I think, yeah. Yeah. Um, was doing an, an interview with um, uh, Mike Pompeo, and she he questioned her ability yeah. to identify Ukraine on the map, and of course, right. famously, yeah. like she she had no problem identifying Ukraine on the yeah. map. Uh, and then the question was like, w how good is the general public at actually doing that? Um, and so this reporter made an interactive on Observable that when you clicked on the map, it would record the location where you clicked, posting it up to AWS and, and storing it as a table so that you could then aggregate all of those results and, and see where yeah. people were clicking. <laughs> um, so let's see, so Robert Kassar has a question for you about uh, video. So Robert, uh, if you wanted to just unmute yourself, go for it. Sure, yeah, hey Mike. Uh, hey, so I saw you mention, uh, so I, I have to say, I, I haven't really done much myself in Observable, but I, I keep getting and, and use it and it's really awesome. And I saw you mention, I think it was, maybe I'm making this up, but I hope, I hope I'm not, <laughs> that you said something about wanting to integrate video into Observable. And so I was curious what your plans were there. Like, is it just going to be full on video, like sort of the, the, the traditional way, or do you have any ideas that go beyond basically YouTube. Yeah, so we're actually um, basically spinning up our DevRel team now. And one of the big initiatives is going to be a series of videos teaching people um, both observable and D3 and visualization and a variety of other things. Um, so we're just getting started with that now. I don't know if it's gonna be like directly integrated into the platform per se. Like I don't think we have any immediate plans to, to build like a MOOC or anything like that within observable. Um, but we are looking at um, other formats uh, for teaching people observable, you know, we've written a lot of notebooks already. Um, and you know, that's nice because it's within the product uh, and you can start tinkering with it, but you know, different people have different styles of learning and we want to sort of, uh, uh, you know, um, make, make it available to people who like those different styles yeah. as appropriate. Yeah. Hmm. Cause I was just wondering if it's more like Khan Academy where there's more sort of like 
integration between video and the, the content. So you have like chapters and maybe like you have to do a thing before you can go to the next step. There's, I mean, this is just me making stuff up here, but I was just curious if you had thought about that kind of thing. Uh, I, no, I don't think so, not yet. I mean, one of the uh, strengths of Observable is that it's code, so you can kind of do whatever you want. So, I mean, you, you, you could theoretically build that. It would be potentially a fair amount of work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, we're, we're open to ideas. I think we're just getting started right now um, with the video content um, and making sort of interactive sessions could be, could be interesting. Yeah. Um, oh, so I'll, I'll again put a call out for people to ask questions. Um, I, I have a, another question for you and I, and this is, it's going to sound like a, um, it might sound like an accusatory question, but it's not. So, um, so, so what I've heard is that the New York Times is moving to using uh, Data Wrapper for all of their their graphics, um, and I know they also have an internal tool for a lot of the journalists to make um, you know more more static things that they need that they need quickly. And I'm just curious. And again, I, I don't. I'm not trying to accuse the Times or Data or anybody of doing anything. Whatever. I'm just curious about your perspective on the model of moving away from using, you know, pure JavaScript or using observable and moving to more towards a tool where it has more of this drop and drag type, you know, mm -hmm. clicking up approach. Well, I would imagine that the New York Times is going to retain like a whole variety of tools at its yeah. disposal for doing interactives. Um, although I'm sure that there's a lot of uh, daily graphics and stuff like that that will be covered well by data wrapper yeah um so i think for us um you know i don't think we're really directly competing with data wrapper because it is more right. of a development environment rather than sort of a point and click construction of visualizations yeah um and also i think we're, all, we're, we're also not really um you know uh, just making a visualization that you can drop into a larger article like there's yeah. a whole variety of things that you can build and observable that are um, you know, either dashboards or sort of explorable explanations um, or sort of real analysis that you're doing in Observable um, mm -hmm. rather than just sort of dropping in some data and then assigning some visual codings and dropping out an, an SVG. Um, so it's really, like I was saying earlier, sort of more about replacing, you know, how people communicate and collaborate within mm -hmm. well, for the, I mean, for the business side of things, because I see the other, the chat question there, you yeah, know, it's about yeah. like how, how do teams of people, you know, at, at, within enterprise that are, you know, all within these data driven organizations needing to make decisions and, and, and get insights out of their data. Like how do they work together around that data? How do they communicate with each other? How do they collaborate on the analysis? And for doing that, you really need the flexibility of code. So there's, there's a lot of stuff that you can do in point and click interfaces, but ultimately at some point, you know, whatever you're doing, you know, uh, <laughs> probably hasn't been done before. If it's giving yeah. you a competitive advantage, like yeah. that's kind of the, the, the definition of doing science is that you're doing something that's new, right? Like you're asking questions that have not been asked before, uh, or at least have not been answered before. And so you need the creativity of code and mm -hmm. so it's really about trying to bring code into the standard ways that people communicate, write stuff down, um, share their results. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to um, talk to Martin's question about the business model for Observable. No, yeah, well, I think it's really just about collaboration. Okay. So for us, we, we have, um, you know, two kind of audiences, I think. And the idea is to have some synergy between those. So we have people that are, you know, using Observable um, out on the public you know, the open source, um, like myself, like doing D3 examples and just sh sharing techniques, uh, sharing our love for visualization or, or whatever else, just making fun, pretty things. Um, and for those people, you know, they're, they're welcome to use it for free. Uh, and then we also have sort of a more enterprise focused product where when people are collaborating around private data or private analysis and they want to work together, they can sign up for a team with an observable and they just pay a subscription fee to go along with mm -hmm. that. Um, great. Um, so we have two questions in the queue. I'll let David, I don't know if David, if you want to, um, unmute yourself, um, you can ask. Oh yeah. Sure, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Hey, Mike, thanks for doing this. This is uh, really interesting. And, you know, I've only dipped my toes into observable, but uh, really exciting to get my feet wet. Um, an exciting thing happening in the R community right now is our markdown is kind of taking off. It's kind of a similar notebook technology. You're probably familiar with it along with many other listeners here. But they've started to like integrate, you know, Bash, Python, SQL, other languages seamlessly within the notebook. And a big dream of mine would be to do something similar within Observable, where maybe I'm, you know, alternating between R or Python before dipping into, you know, D3 and kind of this integrated context. I don't know if that's on your radar, on the horizon, or I'd be curious to know. Yeah, I think that's a pretty common question because, of course, there are a lot of different languages that people use, um, like we were discussing earlier. Um, and I think for us, though, um, JavaScript has so much uh, strength, I think, in, in it being the sort of de facto or lingua franca of the web. You know, it's what every browser runs. And therefore, you know, that's why we put so much emphasis, you know, on JavaScript being the language. And in fact, even why Observable extends the JavaScript language. Um, so when you're writing stuff in Observable, you're not actually writing vanilla JavaScript. It's an extension of the language that we've, uh, you know, we've added these reactive features to it, this data flow to it, um, to simplify how you do, you know, interactive state. Um, so I think we don't have any immediate plans for supporting other languages, but I think what our long-term vision is that we, you know, we want to be able to integrate with other systems or pipelines that people would use. So you might use R or Python to do some data analysis, and then we want to have an easy way to bring that into Observable, either to just do the presentation or to do sort of further uh, like downstream analysis from there. Um, so we have like file attachments is a feature that we launched um, within the last year. And uh, I think we'd also like to see sort of a, a programmatic API for that so that you can easily sort of upload new data into your notebooks um, or to sort of automate the display or like a dashboard or something like that. Um, and so I think that there's always going to be multiple languages that people use. Um, now, there are some interesting possibilities around uh, WebAssembly, um, you know, Mscripten and other tools that let you take languages and compile them into something that can run fast in the browser. Um, so there's been a project um, at Mozilla. Um, iodide was a web-based notebook that had Pyodide, which was basically the ability to run uh, pandas, Python, um, within the browser uh, JavaScript. Um, so we might see some things like that, but we do have a sort of a very uh, strong focus on JavaScript because we're integrating in at the language level. And I think another aspect for us is um, having a single language is also good for collaboration. You know, when the notebooks are all written in the same language, it's easier for you to sort of import and reuse techniques in other notebooks that you can find on Observable. Um, so uh, that's part of it too. Um, before uh, Stuart Thompson, who, you know, I'm sure he's just like chomping at the bit. Um, before we get to Stuart's question, uh, Martin followed up with yeah. me. And he was just to follow up on this on this what you were just talking about. Um, do you use Martin wants to know? It's, I think it's a good question. Do you use JavaScript for everything, or do you also use R, Python, other languages for both? I guess uh, data wrangling and and viz. I mean, for me, uh, I mean, yeah, I use JavaScript for pretty much everything. But of course, I'm not really doing uh, visualization professionally these days. Mm. Um, right. You know, I'm working on building Observable and I'm making examples and we're doing some analysis internally, of course, um, at Observable. And for that, yeah, we use JavaScript sort of all the way down. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, all right. So let's see. Uh, Martin, I hope that was uh, what you were looking for. I don't know. Um, so Stuart uh, Thompson is here. He has a question for you. I don't know if he's. Yeah. Stuart, hey. You want... Yeah. Great. Hey, thanks for doing this, Mike. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just kind of wondering, like, you and your role as, like, a data visualization person, and, like, do you miss having, like, that as your main responsibility, or do you not? I mean, I you still make stuff, but, yeah, I'm just kind of curious about that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I miss it every day. Um, I mean, it was, a, it was a dream job, and I think it's not just, like, you know, getting to work on visualization that has a large audience and they can sort of resonate with the general public. Um, but it's also just, you know, the people that I got to work with at the New York times were fantastic. Um, and I think, you know, all 
all reporters, all journalists, like really have a passion for, for learning and trying to absorb as much information as they can around them. And they're also good at sort of explaining that to other people, like digesting it and, and, and sharing it. And that makes them for uh, very interesting people. Like there's a lot that you can learn from and there's a lot of like good stories. Um, so, so sure, I miss that. <laughs> but I think um, <laughs> one of the things that I enjoy now about the work that I do is also this sense of, you know, trying to build, um, you know, infrastructure or tools that will have lasting value and will change sort of the, the, the set of people that can do, can do this stuff that can have sort of that deeper understanding of what's going on around them, um, the quantitative understanding or the ability to explain it. Um, and so I do, you know, I enjoy building new technologies and I enjoy uh, making them available to people. And it's, it's hard to do that when you have sort of deadlines of, of publishing graphics. So, uh, you know, I'd love to, to do both. I always like having the mix of sort of practical applications like building graphics together with working on sort of the more abstract development of tooling. Like if you, if you just do tooling for too long, then you kind of, <laughs> you lose your concrete foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, what we've tried to do to mitigate that with observable is have a very strong focus on learning from our users, like building out sort of the user research group um, and doing surveys and analytics and, um, you know, obviously just spending a lot of time talking to people, like helping people out uh, when they ask questions in the forum or in Twitter or Slack or, or wherever um, and trying to learn from those frustrations and figure out how we can make the product easier for people to use. Cool. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Stuart. Um, I'll put another shout out there for um, folks to put questions in the in the chat window. Um, uh, Mike, I was going to ask, outside of the big news organizations like the Times, the Post, the Guardian, um, do you have, um, are there other media organizations that you think are doing really phenomenal or just good uh, data viz that people should check out? Uh, well, I think John Byrne Murdoch at the Financial Times is doing some pretty great uh, coronavirus um, visualizations on a regular basis. Um, yeah. And of course, he's well known for popularizing that bar chart race, for better or for worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, do you have any other ones? Yeah. I mean, he's he's great. Um, um, I, I mean, mean, you know, might, you might not have any. I was just curious. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like I've been trying to avoid some of the news uh, lately. I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, since uh, there's there's there aren't any other questions rolling in, so let me ask uh, another one. Um, are you in the camp that uh, that you think everyone should learn to code? Um. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I'm like an absolutist or like more of a pragmatist. I think that it certainly is a valuable skill. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that if we can make it approachable, like if we can actually make it accessible to people, then like that's really what matters. So it, it's sort of a function of how valuable is it combined with sort of how difficult is it for people to learn? You know, if you have something that is extremely difficult for people to learn, and telling everybody that they need to learn it like is just not practical because there's a lot of stuff like they may not get the value out of it that you're expecting. Um, so it's important to accommodate that. So in a sense, like I think there is potential value that is not being realized today because it is too hard for people to learn. And so my focus is on trying to make it more accessible um, rather than just, you know, telling people that they should do this impossible thing. <laughs> right. Is it the, is it the act of actually building something that's important for code or is it being able to think in a particular way it's, that's it's that's language important. is ultimately yeah. what it is right so right. it's really about configuration versus composition um, and it doesn't have to be written it's just that written language or just the concept of a language is inherently going to favor creative composition over something that is really just configuring configuring something that's been built by somebody else yeah. right so it, you know, you can do plenty of creative things um, like uh, in Illustrator or, you know, Sketch or other sort of drawing tools. <laughs> um, 
And, you know, I think that's an example of creativity. I think for computers, um, so, so it's, it's both the, um, like compositional approach. And of course, the fact that when you're expressing language in a way that a computer can understand, you're creating a solution that can basically be scaled up arbitrarily, right? Like can be automated and you, you essentially solve a problem once and now you can solve that problem as many times as you want for no additional cost. Right, right. Um, let's see. So let's see, uh, two other questions, one from Martin again. Um, are there any major developments for D3 on the roadmap? I mean, yeah, there's D3 6.0, which I've been working on for, for quite some time, but which hasn't <laughs> quite made it out the door yet. Although it has made it out in, in sort of piecemeal fashion. So if you recall for D3 4.0, um, the big effort there was to break D3 up from a monolithic library into about 30 different modules that people could use independently. And I think that's had some pretty good traction now. I mean, I think there's been a lot of modernization in the JavaScript tool chain since then. So it's easier for people to sort of pick and choose which parts they want to use. Uh, so for example, D3 Array 2.0 was released a while back. And I think that has some really great improvements to it, both for the JavaScript language in terms of support for iterables, but also like the new D3 group, D3 rollup as a replacement for D3 nest, I think are fantastic. Uh, if I can toot my own horn. <laughs> um, and then there's uh, like D3 Delaunay, which is based on Vladimir Agafonkin's uh, Delaunator, which is a really fast implementation of Delaunay triangulation. And then we implemented uh, Voronoi tessellation on top of that. And so that's going to replace D3 Voronoi. And then there's been a bunch of other improvements like to D3 scale, a bunch of new scale types, um, trying to change um, simplify a little bit how event handling works in D3 selection. So some of it hasn't been done yet, which is why we don't have sort of a, a pre-release available for D3 6.0. Um, but hopefully we will get a chance to do that within the next few months. Um, and in the meantime, you know, people can check out the sort of individual modules and I would particularly yeah. recommend uh, D3 array 2.0. Okay. There's a lot of people who are like twiddling, you know, sort of, rubbing their hands to get together right now, getting ready. Um, <laughs> that's great. Um, so Julia has a question for you about um, helping folks make uh, data viz. Uh, so Julia, if you want to unmute yourself, you can just um, Hi, ask. Yes. Oh, there you are. Um, yeah, I was wondering what, uh, like, what your challenges are and how you resolve them at Observable around helping people to make useful and readable data visualizations, because I figure um, you know, you give somebody a tool, like it's, it, it's one thing to use the tool, but it's another entire skill set making data visualizations that are useful and that achieve what the person wants to achieve. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think we're doing uh, enough there. Um, I think part of it, the challenge is that Observable is more uh, low level focused, right? Like we're focused on sort of how people write code and how they, um, put together interactive interfaces and we're not very opinionated about what those interfaces are. Like we're not um, Vega Lite, for example, like you can use Vega Lite within Observable, um, but you can use any other tool that you want to make your visualizations within Observable as well. And so there's not really um, an opportunity at the platform level to guide people in the creation of visualizations because it's just a, a lower level abstraction. I think we're guiding people to make simpler programs and sort of developing the, the good idioms for representing interactive programs um, within Observable and making them more broadly accessible. But I think ultimately the improvement to visualization practice comes from people helping other people and from discovering and sharing techniques um, sort of through publishing notebooks and through collaborating with other people in the platform. So it's not the platform itself, it's the community of people that are using it and how they work together with each other. And we're trying to make improvements there as well, for example. Um, one of the things that we're working on that should be available at, uh, any day now is sort of improving our commenting system just so that people can talk to each other and comment and, and ask questions about notebooks. Um, I think when we started out with Observable, you know, we, we came from an open source background and we're familiar with the maintenance burden and some of the emotional cost that comes from dealing with random people on the internet every day. And therefore we designed Observable to be very sort of private focused. Like you can send a suggestion to somebody 
to, to like, here's like a code change to your notebook, but you're not allowed to comment directly on other people's notebooks. And I think ultimately that was um, too, too much, erring too much on the side of not letting people talk to each other. And so we're trying to strike the right balance there to allow the community to flourish um, and collaborate with each other. Um, and so hopefully you'll see some improvements soon. And I think also, uh, maybe I would add to that, is that we want to seed some of the content on Observable to teach people how to use uh, both the visualization tools, but also the visualization practice. Um, and you know, we've seen some great stuff, like Jeff Hare at UW, for example, has been publishing a bunch of notebooks on for his visualization classes that are being shared in Observable. And I would love to see more of that um, so I think a combination of examples that people can use, but also sort of critical essays, um, tutorials, guidance, that sort of stuff is what I would love to see from the community. Cool. Thank you. Um, so another uh, just call for other questions. Uh, on that line you were just talking about, Mike, have you, um, have you ever considered or talked to anyone about um, coming up with a or developing a, a D3 JavaScript observable type of environment like the Makeover Monday or the Tidy Tuesday, I don't know, thing? I was going to say program, but I don't know what you would call it. It's a thing. Yeah, I'd love to do some of that. I think, you know, as I mentioned, like our DevRel team is just getting started. And yeah. I think we, we maybe are starting to have some of the bandwidth where we could support things like that. And I think having a regular cadence could be nice for building the community. Um, I mean, it's been a challenge trying to to yeah. do everything that we're trying yeah, to do yeah. with the product yeah. um, and also like do stuff that's just sort of um, supporting the community um, yeah. like as you're trying to build a platform at the same time but I mean I think we're the team's grown a lot um, and so I think we're we're hoping we can start to take on some of those additional responsibilities yeah no it's certainly a big lift I'm yeah I'm sure it's a big lift um, so I mean, I, I'm, I'm, we won't, we don't need to stretch this out if other folks don't have questions. But I'll ask one. I'll ask one more, and then um, if if we're done, we're done, and we can all get cocktails early. Um, uh, I was wondering. Um, I've been in an ongoing discussion, and and have done one of these sessions on teaching data viz to kids. And I'm curious, um, have you thought about or had experience? I mean, I know you have kids of your own, but I'm just curious. Have you thought about or or tried to do teach code or teach JavaScript to kids? And and how do you approach that is it, is it different than any any you know teaching anybody else how to code i mean i, I only have like n equals one sample size on that because i've only <laughs> tried to start teaching my seven-year-old daughter how to code yeah. in observable um and she was super excited about it i mean basically you just put some emojis on there and some sliders and <laughs> or anything like you know colorful and moving um, was enough right. to like anyway she was she was really excited about it and it is um I don't know. It's fun. I mean, I'm always trying to, you know, teach people D3 and like each time you kind of go lower down the stack, it's like, it's harder and harder because you're having yeah. to sort of really surface all of those things that you've internalized and assumed and essentially like forgotten about you, you now process them on a purely subconscious level. And right. so explaining like kind of basic things about, you know, what is a like primitive type, you know, like what is a variable, um, is, it's challenging yeah, if you don't have experience doing that. Um, but I would, I would love to do more of that. I think we are planning on um, doing some, you know, introductions to JavaScript on Observable because I think, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a great platform for learning because it is so focused on letting people start tinkering as soon as possible. Um, and I, I don't know if we'll go, um, you know, so f like down to the seven year old level necessarily, yeah. but I think, um, ultimately I do want, you know, to make JavaScript and programming more accessible to people, not just to visualization. Um, and I would like us to start exploring more stuff like that. Right. Um, so I think we have maybe, I mean, we have about 20 minutes, but there is one question and maybe this will, this will wrap us up, um, from Sarah, who wants to know if someone wanted to get started into contributing to D3, how should they get started? That's a good question. <laughs> I think D3 is not really that uh, friendly for other contributors. And I think part of it is just because um, th there's a desire to keep it small comparatively. 
And also there's a big cost whenever like something is broken, you know, because then you have to go yeah. in and fix it and, and everybody's mad at you. So I think honestly, the best way for people to contribute is really through examples and tutorials um, where you're not necessarily making a new feature, but maybe you're sort of advocating for a new feature um, and you are sort of demonstrating how to do that with the existing API, um, or maybe you're sort of building your own sort of library or an extension. I mean, I think D3 is very modular. So there's been a lot of success, I think, for other modules that add to the sort of core set of D3, um, you know, like D3 legend, D3 annotation, for example, um, and just a, a variety of things like there. So I think that's, that's easier because you won't be sort of gated on me approving your PR being merged into the library. Yeah. Um, but I think there's still plenty of value that you can bring to the community by either teaching other people how to use the D3 API in, in some new way or, you know, advocating for some sort of improvement to the library. Right, right. Um, great. Uh, Sarah, I hope that was helpful. Um, Anker has a question for you on reusable charts. I don't know if you can unmute. Yep. Yeah, specifically, there's been a whole tutorial that Mike had written how to build reusable charts. Have there been any new updates or recommendations that you would suggest? I mean, no, not really. <laughs> I think I, I tend to be fairly agnostic about how people use, um, how people kind of assemble D3 into sort of applications or frameworks. So D3 is not a framework. It's a collection of sort of related tools, like the low level modular library. And I think um, yeah, there's a lot of different ways that you can apply those tools in whatever application you're building. So for instance, you know, if you're using React to build your React application, you know, there's a pretty well established pattern of building React components. And that's probably what I would recommend using if you're using React. If you're using Vue or if you're using Svelte or if you're using Angular, you know, there's different ways of building components in those systems. And I want D3 to be agnostic and to work well with all of those systems. Uh, so I don't really have uh, uh, a stance or an approach that I would recommend over the others. It would depend on the other frameworks um, or development style that you prefer. Ankar, are you all set? Yep. Thanks, Mike. Cool. Okay. My pleasure. Um, let's see, Ben. I don't know if Ben, you want to unmute. Uh, ben has a question for you on data literacy. Hey, yeah, Mike, so this is just a general question, but um, the Tau Center for Data, for Data Journalism rather um, has done like extensive work on, you know, um, algorithmic accountability and then also kind of the convergence of platforms and publishers. I'm just wondering if you have, you know, any, you know, I guess tips of the trade, you know, for data journalists who are thinking about data viz and kind of ethical responsibilities, um, you know, whether it's in the newsroom or thinking about audiences, um, just more broadly, I guess. I think that covers a lot of ground. So let's see, what would I say? I think one of the, one of my um, sort of takeaways from working at the New York Times is just like how important it is to surface all of the assumptions that go into the design of a visualization. And that means the importance of the annotation layer and any sort of keys or legends or guides that sort of explain what the visualization means. The problem as a designer is that you've internalized sort of what your visualization means because you've been working with the data, you understand what the data means and you've wrote the code that assigned those visual encodings. And it's, it's very easy, surprisingly easy to forget to explicitly say, you know, what the X and Y axis means or what the color means or, or what size means and stuff like that. Um, and one of the sort of rules of thumb that I found good working um, on published graphics is like, you know, if you were to just explain your visualization verbally to somebody else, like, would you have something interesting to say or not? Like, if there's nothing that you as the author of the visualization can say is like an interesting takeaway from the graphic, then that graphic probably shouldn't be published because it's really your responsibility as, as the editor, as the author of that graphic 
to have sort of extracted at least a couple sort of interesting insights. And you're then presenting them in a visual way because that might be a more effective way of communicating it. And there may be other things that the reader can sort of pull out of the graphic that you don't include in that initial set. But if there's really nothing interesting that you can say out of the graphic, then you probably haven't done quite enough work yourself to sort of pull out what's interesting. And the great thing about having an explicit annotation layer is that it's essentially forcing you to do that work up front and to highlight at least a couple of the things that are, are good in that graphic. Um, awesome. I mean, sure. Um, yeah, that was, that was interesting. Um, I was going to ask, um, since, since your time at the, at the times, have you, I, 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 I I've observed this anecdotally, but I'm, I'm wondering whether you share it, that there's been a move away from, from interactivity for sort of the everyday graph and whether you think that's a, a good thing or a bad thing or just a thing. I mean, sure. There was that, there was that little bit of hubbub. Um, Gregor Eich wrote a great article on yeah. you know, in defense of interactive graphics. Uh, so I recommend everyone read that if you're interested in the topic. I mean, I think it's like any bit of new technology where things can be overused at the beginning. And then uh, you know the pendulum swings back a little bit, and then people find sort of more refined ways to apply that technology. So I don't think it's really a question of like is interactivity good or bad. Like it can definitely be misused, and it can be used well. And I think you have to understand sort of what the value is that the interactivity is providing, and also the costs that are associated with making a graphic interactive, because there are costs. There's cost to any sort of design trade-off. Um, so I think in particular, the, I think the main risk that you have with interactivity is that it can lead to a potential sort of abrogation of responsibility where like as the editor, you know, you really should be digesting and refining and presenting this information that sort of front loads the most important thing for the reader. And if you have interactivity, there's kind of a temptation where like you can show everything right. to everyone. And like, yeah. you don't have to make that decision because the readers can find it. And the problem is like, it's work for the readers to find it. Like you're just shifting that responsibility from you as the editor to the reader. And so if there's nothing sort of immediately of value to the reader, uh, then the fact that it's interactive is doesn't matter because people aren't going to do that work for you and they're not going to get anything interesting out of it. So I think you have to look at it as kind of a complementary um, mm -hmm tool or ability where you have to, you, you want to have a good static graphic that communicates something. And then in addition to that, you can have something that, that lets the, you know, the reader pull out something that's more of a personalized insight um, or more detailed stuff if they're willing to do the work to engage with the graphic. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I mean, there's kind of, there's a different thing though. I mean, <laughs> about animation right these days and i don't know right. exactly how i feel about that um where i think a lot of the things that get people's attention on social media are things that are animated and is that really a better visualization or is it just something that's where, where it's able to capture people's attention more effectively uh, i don't know well so is it so i guess the question is is it better for that particular platform right because I, I feel like you could create a static graph or an interactive graph you know you could you could create static or interactive for the New York Times site, but you might create even something different for the, for, for Twitter. I'm thinking of like the, um, when the Times yeah. did those, those uh, little racing, swimming animated GIFs for the, uh, for the Olympics, it must've been 2016 or something like that. Like those little, those little animations didn't show up at, at, on the New York Times website. They were only on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. So Sarah, Sarah has a good question uh, related to this is uh, your thoughts on scrolly telling. Uh, well, I've written an article some years ago about how to scroll um, that tries right. to provide more specific guidance on sort of what good scrolling behavior should be and how you can sort of still do things on scroll uh, but not frustrate the user who may have expectations on how the yeah. page should react to scrolling. Um, so I think like any other technique, it should be used judiciously. Um, I think the main advantage that you get with scrolling over clicking 
is that it's sort of the most common and accessible affordance. Um, like it's in particular, like for, for journalism, you know, you're, you're telling a story usually at, at the very least, like there should be one sort of one dimensional path or, or narrative through the article or through the story that you're trying to tell and scrolling typically is also one dimensional. And that's therefore that's an advantage. Like it's, similar to just reading static text, but now like you can have other things that are happening alongside of it um, that lets you do something potentially more interesting. Um, but I mean, I don't tend to use it very much on observable, I think, um, but I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't have any sort of explicit guidelines as to like when it's appropriate to use it or when it's not. I just kind of know when it's done poorly, it can be frustrating. Um, uh, this is a, a I'm, I'm like, taking advantage for a second, but like uh, when it comes to scrolly telling and any sort of other interactivity in particular with observable, how are, are you and how are you thinking about uh, needs for accessibility um, for people? Like scrolly telling is a good example because there are people when you have these two different things that are moving not in, in sequence or one is showing on top of another one that can trigger, you know, different types of migraines and reactions and, and things like that. So I'm just curious how you're thinking about vision issues or cognitive disabilities or any of that? Um, I, I mean, I think that's a challenge for the visualization space as a whole. I yeah. mean, it turns out that by, for technical reasons, like coincidentally, like you can't actually implement scrolly telling within observable. I mean, there's probably mm -hmm. a way around it, but generally speaking, because of the way the code gets run in this sandboxed iframe, it's much harder to do sort of typical on scroll fancy effects. And so I, I haven't really seen it done on observable, although it may be possible if you're willing to jump through a few hoops. Um, there's certainly some things that you can do with intersection observers, but um, I think the other primary thing that where I've seen people make some progress in terms of making visualizations more accessible are sort of color deficiency issues and trying to both come up with good defaults for colors um, both like for ordinal or categorical colors and for sort of continuous or sequential color schemes. Um, and then like tools that let you sort of either try to evaluate um, contrast levels or simulate different types of color deficiencies. Um, so I think early on, you know, we added Cynthia Brewer's color brewer color schemes to D3 as a D3 scale chromatic. And we also eliminated the category 20 color schemes, <laughs> which was somewhat <laughs> controversial, but I think was the right call because they were essentially paired color schemes, which tended to create sort of a false association between the light variant and the dark variant of the same hue. Like you'd have a light blue and a dark blue that would seem to be related when of course they're categorical right. and they probably weren't. Um, and also it's just difficult to distinguish 20 categorical colors. And so we just yeah. got rid of those and we switched to 10. And I think that's help, hopefully encouraged people to switch to using like an other category if they have more than 10 categories that they want mm -hmm. to include in their visualization. Um, and I've seen some sort of interesting uh, new work on like perceptual color spaces, um, some of which has been done in observable so there's like a Jay-Z, A-Z, B-Z uh, color scheme. Um, but basically, like they're just designed to sort of give you, um, you know, distance in color space equates to sort of perceptual distance. So that like if two color coordinates are similar, you're likely to perceive those as similar colors. If they're very different, you perceive them as different colors. And so you can start to quantify like in this color space, how different two colors are, and therefore measure like contrast ratios. Ah, gotcha. um, and one of the interesting things is some of the color metrics that we use, for example, there's a WCAG contrast ratio, um, uses, uh, I think it's, well, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's definitely not one of these like perceptual color schemes. And I don't think they even use like linear light color schemes. So it's just like RGB values. Um, and so it's pretty heavily distorted and there's some criticism that they should be using sort of a more uh, perceptually based color scheme or color space for doing this analysis. On the other hand, um, they're pretty rudimentary tools for evaluating 
um, sort of what contrast ratios are. So I don't know if it, if that's more of a pedantic argument or if it would make a practical improvement. Right, right. Um, I think we have one more from, uh, from folks. Uh, Ivan has a question for you on um, using observable for hiring. So Ivan, if you're there. Hey there, thank you for your amazing tools. I love them both. Uh, uh, probably you have much more. <laughs> Um, the question is, uh, I know a lot of companies use GitHub for hiring people. And so I'm curious to know, do they use observable for that? Uh, well, I don't know for certain, but it's definitely, I think one of our hopes is that, you know, people can kind of build up a visualization portfolio, um, and, uh, do that more easily and observable than they could, they could somewhere else. Uh, and then use that, you know, in their CV or their resume to sort of give demonstration of someone's abilities. Uh, I mean, certainly like in, in our own hiring, of course, like we look to see, you know, what <laughs> observable notebooks has somebody written and we do like some pair programming or interviewing stuff that are based in within observable notebooks. Um, but I, I don't know if we've quite reached the mainstreamness yet <laughs> to be competing with GitHub as the sort of like de facto portfolio, but, uh, you know, maybe yeah. eventually. Maybe. Yeah. One day, one day. Um, so one more question from Martin, uh, which I think is a good way to, to, uh, wrap up, which is, uh, what's your favorite observable uh, notebook? I, I refuse to answer this. I don't know. <laughs> it would not be fair. No, um, no comment on that one. <laughs> I think, I mean, I, I have been really impressed, I think, by the the work that's been done on like analyzing the coronavirus or COVID-19 data recently. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's just been literally hundreds of notebooks that people have published that are looking at the data and visualizing it in different ways and sort of creating sort of more localized views, you know, like somebody wants um, like New York Times does a great graphic for sort of the US, but like if you're in another part of the world and you have data, yeah. like you can just fork that and replace it and create a sort of more localized view as well. Um, so that's been cool. And I've definitely learned um, from some of the other more uh, analysis focused things, like, you know, mm. people looking at creating simulations uh, of the coronavirus, you know, like these SIR and SEIR uh, epidemi yeah. epidemiological models. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But of course, I think I would caveat that with uh, it can be challenging and dangerous to potentially try to draw too much from the simulations that people create if you don't have a background in epidemiology. Um, yeah. So they can be sort of intellectually interesting, but I would be careful about trying to draw too many conclusions from them. Right, right. Cool. Um, this is great. Thanks, man. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for all Appreciate the questions. It. Um, yeah, everybody, that was great. Let me just uh, quickly share next week, if you're interested. Let me share a different screen because I have the times up now. Um, there we go. If you're interested in uh, chatting next week, on Tuesday, Michael Carell, Jessica Holman, Robert Cressara from noon to 1 uh, Eastern time. Michael Branner for Data for Change on Wednesday from 11 to 12 Eastern time. And on Thursday, Tom Mock. Uh, who runs the Tidy Tuesday, our project, and works at our studio, will be here from 3 to 4 on Thursday. And uh, that's all I've got for now. That's probably enough. Um, so thanks, Mike. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Go enjoy your evening cocktails. And, um, yeah, talk to you all soon. Thanks again, Mike. That was great. Appreciate Cheers. it. Cheers. Okay, Thank take you. Care.